uh, they throw me on the ground. They're like, get on the ground, get on the ground. I was just like numbed. I get on the ground. They handcuffed me, pulled me off, pulled me up, dust me off. And I remember they're holding me and I'm just standing there. They're like, Matt Cox, are you Matt Cox? Mr. Cox. And I'm just staring at him and I'm not saying anything. And the guy looks at, he has a clipboard with my wanted poster on it. And he holds it up and he's looking and another officer comes up. And I remember he looked at me and he goes, is that him? Is it him? He goes, no, I don't think it is. Oh, shit, I don't think it's him, bro. And he looks at me and he goes, no, it's him, it's him. He goes, look at his eyes, it's him. And he looks at me and he goes, hey, Mr. Cox. He goes, we've been looking for you. And, I, and he goes, you are Mr. Cox. You are Matthew Cox, right? And I went, yeah, yeah, I'm Matt Cox. <laughs> Hey, so the last time we did, I did a video, I had just arrived in Nashville, and I was living as Joseph Marion Carter Jr., and I went by Carter, and I, I think I already, had a, I already had a vehicle. No, I didn't have a vehicle yet. That's right, that's right. I just rented the duplex. Okay, now I remember. So I just rented the duplex from the old man in Green Hills, and I was still driving. I was still driving my Infinity. That's right. So... I, I remember I ordered Marion Carter. I remember Carter's, I got Carter's birth certificate and I got his, um, I went and got, I went and got a new social security number in his name and I ordered some secured credit cards, but I didn't have a driver's license. So, but, but I did, I registered to vote in his name and I had a lease in his name. So I have a lease. I've got a lease. I've got his birth certificate. I have a social security card. I've registered to vote in his name. I have his transcripts for his driving record. And I took all of that and I went to the local DMV and I got a driver's license. I remember I had to take the driving test. I had to take the driving test in the Infinity. Did I say Lexus? It was infinity. It was an infinity. So in the infinity, that was the that the police were currently looking for. I even took the driving test, and I almost failed the driving test. I remember I was clicking through because you know every I've taken driving tests in a bunch of different states, but every every state's different, and they asked several questions on for like uh, driving while intoxicated. And I remember I missed several questions. I also missed the question where it shows a picture of a sign and it has people walking. And I thought, oh, that's pedestrian. It's a pedestrian zone. But it wasn't because of some, one of the guys had a briefcase and it was a business zone. Missed that question. So I missed like three or four questions. I was like, oh, my God, I almost failed. I remember when I went up to get my license, I go, I, I told the woman, I said, I almost failed. And she goes, I know. She goes, you were one, point, one question away. So I got my driver's license. I then jumped into the infinity and i drove the infinity all the way back to this now keep in mind the police are looking for the infinity now there's a bolo out for the infinity i drove all the way back to nashville and i left it in long-term parking because i didn't want it to be found in nashville all the way back to charlotte north carolina i didn't want it to be found in nashville i wanted the car to be found in charlotte in long-term parking so i i parked it I then waited a little bit, and I, I bought a ticket and flew back to Nashville. Uh, and then I went to, I don't, I think it was, it was like CarMax or Nations or something. They, they have these, diff, they, had, they had, it was like CarMax. Anyway, I went to this dealership, and I walked in. Keep in mind, this guy, I, I've got three secured credit cards in his name. I've ordered them, but I, I hadn't even gotten the cards yet. Like we're talking about within days, I just ordered the cards. So he's got a credit profile, but there's no credit at all. But it's not bad credit. I went to like whatever it was, like Nations Cars or Car CarMax or something. I walk in there and I said, listen, man, I need to get an SUV. And I need some kind of first time buyers program. They go, well, we have one. You have to put down 20% and you cannot buy a vehicle for more than $20,000. I said, let's go find one. So we went and found one, and it was a Nissan Pathfinder or something. So I got like a twenty thousand dollars Nissan Pathfinder. I put down four thousand dollars. I gave them a W. I gave them a W two and a pay stub. They called to verify my employment. 
I answered the cell phone, verified my own employment, and they gave me a, a, I got the car right then. So I drove the car home. So I drove the car home. I'm now, I've now got a new vehicle. I've got an apartment. I've got a driver's license. I applied for a passport. I got my passport. I've got, but I'm, I'm burning through the money quick. I remember I got some furniture and I realized, of course, you know, at this rate, um, I'm burn, already burning through money. I don't have a job, so I don't have a lot to do. I don't know anybody in Nashville. Uh, I'm working out, you know, once or twice a day. I'm, you know, I, I don't have much. To, I, I don't have anything to do. I'm you know, going to Starbucks. I go work out. I walk around the mall. I come back. I, I mean, there's just nothing to do, right? So I start driving around and looking at real estate. Because I figure I'm going to run another scam. I'm going to get a few million dollars and just, I was just going to leave. Like, I was just going to leave the United States and just, it, it, at this point, things are bad. Like, if you punched in Matthew Cox into into Google, it, everything that came up was, you know, fraud, fraud, fraud. And And by this point, there were several articles about me having been caught in South Carolina by the police and that they they let me go. That wasn't good. There was more and more articles about that. It was becoming more and more sensational. The Chicago Tribune started running a series called The Fugitive. I, it, it, was, it was just not good. It's not a good situation. So I, I, I ended up dating, though. I was bored, so I ended up going on a couple of dating websites, and I started dating a bunch of different women. I dated a chick named uh, Brittany Sutherland. I dated a bunch of different girls. Like I go over it in the book. I think I, I have like a whole chapter on just the insane women I started dating. This went on for like four or five months. Well, it, while that was happening, I also went and I started, I found an area of Nashville that I liked where the houses were going for, I mean, they were just dirt cheap. They're going for they're going for forty thousand. If they were renovated, if a house was renovated, you could get it for sixty-five or seventy thousand dollars. It was just that. That was how bad this area was. So I go in the area. I end up talking one owner into owner financing me the property. Her house was so bad it was going for like she wanted like nineteen grand or fifteen grand, fifteen, sixteen grand, nineteen grand. I forget. It was cheap. I have the the exact numbers in, in my book, but I end up getting her to own her fine. I gave her like four or five, like three or four thousand dollars down, and have her finance like something like ten or fifteen thousand dollars. So then I find another guy who buys and sells houses. He flips houses. I buy, convince him to own her finance three houses. You have to understand. I convinced them to owner finance the house by saying, "Look, I'll give you five percent down, or ten percent down, or twenty percent down." But I tell them, like, I don't want to buy your house. Like this one guy, his houses were renovated. They were all selling for about sixty-five thousand. One was going for seventy-five thousand. So I think it was like two were sixty-five thousand, one was seventy-five thousand. Regardless, I say, "Look, I'll. I need you to owner finance the the houses." For him, I said, "I need to close on all three houses on one, on one HUD statement." That way, all of the houses end up getting recorded for like $210,000 or something outrageous. Was that the one I did that with? No, that was another transaction. Anyway, for him, I, I, for the woman that I got to do it, I told her I wanted to record the sale of the home at like $150,000, even though I was buying it for like twenty. dollars So for, let's say, $150,000, and I wanted to, um, I wanted a construction credit on the house for like one hundred thirty thousand, and I would pay the doc stamps. So it gets recorded for one hundred fifty thousand dollars. I paid the extra doc stamp. So in sa the sale ends up showing up in public records as being a sale for one hundred fifty thousand dollars. And I think it was like one fifty two or one fifty four. It was roughly around there. The other three properties, I get this guy. I end up. I didn't do them all in one closing statement. I had each one I added like a hundred and some odd thousand dollars to each sale, so one got one was came in at like a hundred and ninety thousand. One came in at like one hundred and seventy five, and the other ones came in at like one seventy five. Well, I did all of these houses were within about three or four blocks of each other. So what obviously, if you've been watching, what that ended up doing was I could now use that one property, you know, each house I could use the other houses as comparable sales. 
I immediately refinance those houses and pull out like 100,000 on this house, 120 on this one, 90,000 on this house. So I, I refinance those houses. Now I'm flush with cash again. I have like 30, I mean, I'm sorry, 30. I have like 300, $350,000. So now I'm, I'm, I'm doing okay. So I start buying more houses in the area because, you know, I don't have anything else to do and it's just what I do. So, I, and I need to get a few million. So I need to buy 20 or 30 properties. I figure I can refinance all those properties in multiple names. At this point, I'm starting to build additional credit profiles for additional synthetic identities. But I'm also dating. I end up meeting this girl named Amanda Gardner. So I, I meet Amanda, and Amanda and I start dating, and she she thinks I'm like this just super successful real estate guy. So I ended up buying a house in that same neighborhood where I was buying all the other houses. I buy this one, this one house, and I renovate it. I renovate it. It's super nice. I've got hardwood floors. It's really, really nice. And... But I'm, I'm buying other houses too. I'm continuing to drive the value of this area up through the roof while I'm building other identities. I end up meeting Amanda. Amanda and I hit it off right away. I mean, what's not to hit out? What's not to like? I mean, she's she sees me. I've, I'm a decent looking guy. I've got a ton of money. She had just gotten out of the military. She had a son named Cameron. Uh, he was a cute little kid. Um, he... You know, he liked me. Amanda loved me. She moved in with me right away. I mean, right away, within weeks or months, she was living in my house. And keep in mind, too, she's she's broke. So I, I look like a savior to her. And I'm buying her whatever she wants. Uh, I got her and bought her a new car. She's got new clothes. Granted, we live in a shit in a shithole area, but we also I I also own at this point eight to ten houses in the area. I'm buying vacant lots. Within six months, I'm, I'm building brand new houses. And, and she, she quit her job. She's helping me now. So I, I remember one of the houses, like the, really to be honest, this is funny. The, one of the first houses I refinanced, one of the first houses I, I, I refinanced. So going back a little bit, I, I remember I had bought these houses, just the first four houses I bought. Before I refinanced anything, bought the houses, recorded the value high. And what was so funny about that was um, I ended up, um, I ended up putting these signs on the houses. I put these, I made these banners that said Nashville Restoration Project. So I made these banners and I stuck them on every one of the houses. I renovated the houses so they looked really good on the outside like they didn't look great inside they look like crap but i put these banners and the banners said you know nashville restoration project nashville restoration project over and over again and then along the side of it it would have like nashville restoration project.com and then i designed a website i got a ton of before and after photos from properties i took pictures of the entire neighborhood i really dressed up the website i mean it looked great i even used the same exact color scheme as as uh, the city's future comp plan. So every city has a future comprehensive plan for what they want their city to look like in the future. And typically they work in conjunction with different developers. So I basically said I was one of those developers. The other thing I said on the website was that this area in Nashville was called J.C. Napier. That was the na subdivision. That was the name of the area. And it was right next to the J.C. Napier projects. So the problem with that is that um, there, was the, there was obviously this is right next to the project. So you can imagine the kind of area this is. So on my website, I specifically said that the projects were scheduled to come down within the next two years. They were currently vacating the, the projects. So... If you went, if you looked up Nashville Restoration Project or you went to the website, you got all this information that said this entire area was being, was going through gentrification or being revitalized. The city was dumping a ton of money into it. Developers were coming in there. It was work. We were working in conjunction with the, with the future comp plan with the city and that the projects were coming down within the next 
year or two, 18 months to two years. So, uh, and, and there's a ton of photos of all these houses being renovated. Anyway, uh, what I ended up doing was I refinanced one of the houses and I con and when the appraiser comes out, I go to meet him at one of the houses. So I go out there and I said, so, uh, you know, we, we, he measures the whole house. I said, well, what do you think? And he looks at the house and he was a grumpy old guy and he kind of looked at the house and he goes, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not bad. It's not too bad. And I said, what do you think it's going to come in? What do you think it's worth? He goes, what did you pay for it? And I said, I paid like a hundred and I think I paid like $180,000 for it. And he looked at the house and he goes, you know, a year ago, I'd have said this thing was worth 50 or 60,000. I went, really? He said, yeah, but you know, since the, he has, since the, uh, the Nashville restoration project has come in this area, he has, this whole area is going up through the roof. There's comparable sales popping up all over the place. There's, um, he has, there's, he has, there's comparable sales popping up all over the place. Uh, it's, he said the whole he said the, the the whole area is going up through the roof. He goes, I, I'd say this this thing's worth at least 180, 185,000, whatever he ended up saying. And I just remember thinking, fuck, that's awesome. It was great because he bought it. He'd he'd obviously go, and I knew he went to the website because he told me he goes, you know the projects are coming down. And I was like, really? And he goes, Yeah, he said the projects are coming down. And then I remember, I'll never forget, he said this. He said, you know. I said, Jace, I said, Nashville Restoration Project. I said, really? I said, and what is that anyway? And he goes, yeah, it's, a, it's one of these big developers. They work with the city. They come in. They revitalize an entire area. He said, you know, they did the same thing in Germantown about 10 years ago. I go, really? He goes, oh, yeah, Nashville Restoration Project went in there. They revitalized the entire area. You can't buy anything in Germantown now that's not worth less a million dollars. He goes, you hold on to this place. You're going to easily double your money in the next year or two. I was like, wow, thanks. Like, he totally added that whole thing like that wasn't anything i said i didn't know about germantown i didn't know anything even about the area he threw that in there so that house that's one of the first houses i refinanced which i always thought was hilarious because what i did was i went into that area bought up all those houses and put signs on every single house that said nashville restoration project and then of course i kept recording the value of these houses higher and higher so within a couple of within a year, these things are everywhere. There's 20 properties that are worth over two hundred thousand dollars. I can refinance these things anytime and get two or three million dollars easily. Hey, I hope you're enjoying the video. And if you're interested in buying a painting from me, my contact information is in the description box. Back to the video. So I'm dating Amanda. Everything's going good. Um I've built up several synthetic identities and we'd been dating about a year and the relationship was going great. Uh, we start seeing, so this is what's comical. One of the chicks that I had gone on a date with was a chick named uh, Trina. I went on a date with Trina and we went out one time and I just wasn't interested. She had, like, typically I like a southern accent, but she had this really, really bad, almost like a Kentucky southern accent, which is way different than a Florida or Georgia southern accent, which to me I find sexy. Trina's was not sexy. And so we went out. We went to, uh, I remember when we went to go see the movie The Dukes of Hazards, which she wanted to go see. So we went to go see it, and afterwards... Like, I didn't even try and kiss her or anything. I just wanted to get out of there. I wasn't interested. I got my car and left. Well, Amanda and I were dating, and at one point, Amanda says to me, you know, you know, at, you know how it is. You, you're sleeping with a chick, and you've been sleeping with her for a while, and uh, six months or something, and, and she, Amanda ended up saying, have you ever thought about being with another woman? You know, me and another woman. And I was like, yeah, I, I mean, I guess I, I would be willing to do that, you know, out of love for you. Um... So she says, well, I would be interested. And so Amanda, you know, Amanda starts looking. Amanda starts looking on the website. Um, shit, it's called uh, Match.com. She starts looking for other women. So she comes across Tr uh, Trina. And I remember looking at Trina's profile and being like, holy shit, I went out with that girl. And she says, no, you didn't. I said, I swear to God, I went out with her. I said, flip through her pictures. There's a picture of her leaning against a Corvette and another one where she's running a marathon. Sure enough, that was her. And I was like, I went out with her. She goes, what happened? I told her, I kind of blew her off. She sent me a couple of emails at, or a couple of 
text messages afterward and I just never responded. So Amanda hits her up, asks her if she wants to meet. They go to a lesbian bar because it turns out that Trina was was gay. They go to a lesbian bar. Amanda and her end up making out in a car in the car. She mentions me, asks if she would be interested in all of us getting together. Trina says yes. We all end up going to dinner. Trina comes back home. You can imagine what happens. So what ends up happening is we all we all start to hang out together, right? Like we're going to festivals, we're going to movies, Trina's coming over every once in a while. Like things are good. Life is good. Uh, I've got tons of money. We're building new houses. We're re- renovating houses. And everything is going good. Well, then one day, Amanda ends up going online. Well, I'm, okay, that's not how it happened. So here's what happened is at one point, Amanda ends up finding... I had a corporate lawyer that had incorporated all of these several uh, corporations because obviously I can't just dump all this money in my account. You have to kind of launder it through different accounts. So, and, I, and those accounts actually were in Amanda's name. So what ends up happening is I... The corporate lawyer contacted me one day and asked me to send her something. I sent it to her, never heard... Or, you know, she never got it for some reason. So she called back and she called Amanda and said, hey, I never got this document. So I told Amanda, go on my computer and look in Word. Here's the name of the document. Well, when Amanda did that, she ended up seeing a, finding a letter that I the letter that I had written to my parents the day I left Tampa two years earlier, two and a half years earlier. She finds that letter. She reads the letter. She looks up who Matt Cox is. She sees a ton of, ton of articles. She spends the whole day reading articles. By the time I get home that night, I walk in. I'm like, hey, what's going on? And she's like, oh, everything's fine. Everything's fine. She says nothing. I end up going on my computer. And when I go to do, to close out all of the programs, I see that Word is open. When I go to click on Word to close it, I see the last thing that had been opened was the letter to my parents. And obviously I hadn't opened it in a year and a half, two, in like two years. So I was I realized, holy shit, she read it. So then I go and I look at my history and boom, there's nothing but all these articles on Matt Cox, Matt Cox, Matt Cox, Matt Cox. I wanted, wanted, wanted. So I, I go in and I said, Jesus, God Almighty, I said, did you, what did you do? And she was like, and she, she immediately realizes that I know she breaks down. She starts crying. She says, I'm sorry. I had no idea. I I didn't mean to. I said, well, I have to leave. So I can't stay here if you know who I am. If anybody knows who I am, like it's dangerous for me. She begs and pleads and cries and says, please don't leave. Please don't leave. I'll never, I'll never tell anybody. I'll never tell anybody. And the truth is I was like totally in love with this chick. I thought she was amazing. She was great. So I stayed. So she knows my name, true name is Matt Cox, not Carter, not Joseph Carter, which is bad for me. Um, we end up seeing Trina. Everything's going good. One day, Amanda goes online. She was checking on Google. Just randomly, she would check my name. So she checks my name, and she sees something on Dateline. Turns out that Dateline was was about to do an article on me. I'm sorry, an article. Dateline was about to do a news program on me. At, at this point, I've already been in... Bloomberg Magazine has already done two articles. One about just about me, and two... The second article was when they caught Becky, because they had caught Becky at this point. Then I had been in Fortune Magazine had done an article on me. Like a 6,000 word article. Horrible. Uh, then, so, so then she went online and she found this article about, not to mention all the St. Pete Times articles, all the Chicago Tribune, all the Atlanta Journal Constitution. There was just one article after another. So she finds this thing about Dateline, and there's a blog about Dateline, how they're interviewing people that, have, that knew me or that know me. And they're going to do a one-hour episode on me. So I now know I'm going to be on Dateline. That's not good. Like, local newspapers aren't a big deal. 
even a national magazine or two, like the kind of people that I hang, first of all, I don't have a big circle of friends. The kind of people that know me or that I associate with aren't reading Fortune magazine. These are con contractors. Like I'm not concerned about them stumbling across my photo in Fortune or Bloomberg. But this is Dateline. It's a tabloid. And your average blue collar worker watches Dateline. Dateline, I don't even know if it's still out, but so I realize I'm going to be in, in living rooms everywhere and somebody's going to recognize me. I'm somebody working at Starbucks or working at Home Depot is going to say, holy shit, that guy comes in here all the time. They're going to catch me. Like it's a problem. So Amanda tells me about it and I go, Jesus, oh my God, this is, this is really bad. I can't stay in the United States anymore. So she and I decide we've got a month or two, about two months, a couple months before it comes out. We decide we're going to refinance all the houses, pull out a few million dollars and leave the United States. And at this point, we started researching where to go. We figure we're going to go to, uh, to Australia. And it, the nice thing about Australia was Australia would allow you to go to Australia. If you had a, okay, you, if you showed up in, in Australia with like $200,000 and a business plan to open a business in Australia, you could go there and you could be a permanent resident alien. They would give you a driver's license. They'd allow you to buy property. They would allow you to stay in their country and open a business. You could not go to Australia and get a job, but you could go there and open a, a business and hire Aussies. So I can't go there and become a citizen because if you were to go and become a citizen, they wanted you to do a background check. But I could go there and become a with U.S. documents, if I showed up with my U.S. passport, I could become a permanent resident alien. And keep in mind, I'm, I'm living as a homeless person. I can easily become a permanent resident alien in Australia, and he'll never be notified. And then if he dies someday, they're not going to turn around and notify Australia that I died. So we decide we're going to Australia. A man has researched the whole thing. I start refinancing properties. I start pulling out cash. As we're pulling out cash, we start asking people like my general contractor. His name was Tracy. I ask him, hey, can, would you do me a favor and could you cash some checks for me? And I, he's like, yeah, sure. So I have him cash a check for like 8000 then another check for 6000 another check for 9000 Then I have another guy that we worked with cash a check for 4000 3000 9000 And then I have... So, Amanda ends up giving Trina a check uh, of several checks and asks her to asks her to, to cash those checks. I remember Amanda and I had gone. We had a couple of friends. Uh, one was Brittany, another chick that I had dated, and her new boyfriend, which they had just gotten married. His name uh, his name was Brian. So Brian and Brittany, we went with them on their honeymoon to, to Venice, to Italy. We went there for like 10 days. We did a 10-day trip. So we were gone for two, three weeks. We left and we went to Croatia. We went to Greece. Like we hung out. We went on this cruise, European cruise. And I remember we'd come back. And as soon as we came back, we hadn't been home more than a few weeks when we started asking everybody to cash checks to start pulling out money. So we're pulling out money. And we had pulled out a few hundred thousand dollars. One day I'm at home and suddenly I hear this, bam, somebody had kicked in the front door. And it was like, oh my God. And I had, I had cameras all over my house. I had cameras in the living room, dining room, outside the house. But I would go to walk out to see what happened because I remember it was so loud. I remember thinking maybe the TV had fallen. Like the we had a big flat screen TV and I thought maybe Cameron had pulled the, knocked the TV over or something. I don't know. But as soon as I walked, started walking out of the, the bedroom, this fucking guy, these two black guys had kicked in the front door, comes running in and he sticks a gun in my face and he goes, get on the ground, get on the ground. So I go, oh Jesus. So I get on the ground. They lead Amanda in the room. She gets on the ground. Cameron gets on the ground. They throw a blanket over us. They robbed the whole house. 
they grab some. I, I, I mean, literally, I'm like, bro, what do you want? You know, they're, they're, they're like, shut up, shut up. I'm like, what do you want? And they said, you know, where's the money? Where's the money? I said, bro, there's money here. Like I told them where there's some money here. There's some money here. We had some money in the refrigerator or in the freezer. I didn't say that. I told them to get the money out of that. They, we had a, a, a gun safe, which was Amanda's gun. And they grabbed the gun safe. They grabbed our Rolexes. They grabbed a couple of uh, Cartier watches and stuff and some jewelry. And then they grabbed, oh, they grabbed the keys to, I think, Amanda's truck. And they jumped in her truck and took off. Hey, sorry for interrupting the video, but want to let you guys know that if you join my Patreon at the top tier every single month, you get a different painting. And the contact information for my Patreon page is in the description. Back to the video. No, did they take my truck? I don't know. They stole one of our vehicles. So we immediately sit up and uh, as soon as they're gone, we call the police. Police show up and the guy, the cops, like, I'm like, hey, I got a video of it. But they had ski masks on. Um, so the cop comes and he's, I remember he told me, look, you need to find another place to live. You, you can't, you, you, you guys can't stay here. Like you can't stay in this neighborhood. You know, I said, I, I told him I own like 20 houses in the neighborhood. I own another five or six lots. We're building new houses. He's, I don't care. He goes, what these guys didn't steal this time, they'll just come back and steal. So I said, okay. So we ended up going to a hotel. Well, I didn't, they had taken my, my wallet. So I didn't have my driver's license or my, they took my, a bunch of stuff. I didn't have anything in my name. So they took all my stuff. All I had was a passport in the name Walter Holcomb. So they took my Joseph Carter stuff. So I got a passport as Walter Holcomb and a driver's license in Walter Holcomb's name. So when we go and we check into a hotel, we were there maybe a day or two. We didn't go back to the house. We were, gonna, we were just going to buy a new house and stay in the hotel. It was a really nice hotel. So we stay in the hotel. And while that's happening, Trina is calling because they took our cell phones. So we get our new cell phones back. And I remember Trina, as soon as I got it back and mine was back on, like we got a phone call. I, I got a phone call from Trina. And she was like, oh, my God, what have you, where have you guys been? What are you doing? What's going on? Where's Amanda? What's happening? I said, Trina, calm down. I said, look, we had a home invasion, and we're staying in a hotel. And, and I said, uh, she goes, what hotel? And I went, I remember thinking, what? Like, she didn't say, like, are you okay? How's it? Oh, my God, that's horrible. She goes, what hotel are you at? And I was like, I'm, I'm at the... Whatever hotel it was, I just told her the name of the hotel. I forget, like the, fuck, I don't remember what it was, the, the Westing or something. So I tell her, yeah, it was this hotel. And she goes, okay, well, tell Amanda to call me because Amanda was in the shower. I go, okay, no problem. So I hang up the phone. Uh, what had happened was a couple days earlier, Trina had called the Secret Service and turned us in. And the Secret Service had gone to my old ha my house where we weren't staying and had staked out the house for the, like the day at the day we left that night, the next day they showed up and started staking out the house. So they'd been staking it out for two days and we weren't there. So she was calling to try and find out where we were. So she called the secret service back. She said, this is where they are. They sent secret service sent a team sent themselves and the marshals went to the hotel where we were. And they asked, is Joseph Carter staying here? And they said no, because I wasn't. I was staying there as Walter Holcomb. So then Trina calls back and says, I called the hotel. You're not, there. You're not there. And I was like, it was weird. I was like, what? And at that point, I wasn't at the hotel. I, I was at, the, at our office. We had rented like a, a 10,000 square foot warehouse. And I said, look, I'm not there. I'm, she goes, are you there now? I said, no, I'm at the warehouse. Amanda was dropping off her son. And she goes, well, okay, so you're there now. Is Amanda with you? And I went, no, Amanda's dropping off Cameron. And she goes, okay, uh, I got to go. And she hangs up the phone. Like a couple minutes later, Amanda calls me. And I go, hey, what's up? She goes, Trina just called me. She goes, and I go, okay, well, what's going on? She goes, I don't know, Matt, I'm worried. I said, uh, not Matt, she said, uh, uh, Carter. She goes, I don't know, Carter, I'm worried. And I said, why? And she goes, I'm worried because she is." It, she, she said some stuff like she told me how much she loves me and cares about me 
And she goes, it was just weird. And I go, she goes, I'm, I'm concerned. I go, what are you concerned about? I go, if she doesn't know anything, what are you worried about? And she goes, oh, God, Matt, I'm so sorry. And by this point, I'm, I'm concerned. Because by this point, I got a phone call from the local police. And the local police asked me if I could meet them, if I could meet them at the house. So I'm, dri- I'm now driving to the house. Because they wanted me to meet them at the house because they said they wanted the video of the home invasion. So I'm driving to the house. And when Amanda called, and she's, and I'm getting in the car, I'm driving, and I'm like, yeah, what, what are you worried about? And she goes, oh, my God, man, I'm so sorry. I'm worried. I'm worried. I go, what, what are you worried about? So at that point, I had just pulled up to the house because our, our place was only a couple blocks away, our office. So I pull up to the house, and I'm like, well, if you're not worried, I mean, if, if you're worried, you must be worried about something. What are you worried about? If she doesn't know anything, there's no reason to be worried. And she's like, I, I, you know, she didn't want to tell me what had happened. But she goes, I think I might have fucked up. And I go, how did you fuck up? What are you, what are you trying to say? Like, what is going on? And by this point, I'm getting out of my car, walking to the front to my house. And a black SUV pulls up. Another SUV pulls up. Another car pulls up. Another one pulls up. And they all lock up their brakes. And I'm standing there in the middle of the street holding my cell phone when the Secret Service jumps out of their vehicles screaming, get on the ground, get on the ground, get on the ground. And obviously at that point I realized what the issue is. Amanda, I I later found out, Amanda had told Trina who I was and Trina had called the Secret Service and turned me in. And when Trina called Amanda... She was basically just making sure that she wasn't with me, that she wanted her to know how much she loved her and cared about her and was trying to kind of distance herself from the situation. And I, uh, I ended up getting arrested. So the Secret Service runs up to me and I remember, you know, I remember at first I thought I was getting robbed again until I saw the secret. They have these white, they're, they're all in black with they have these white things that say Secret Service on them. So there was Secret Service was there. And uh, they throw me on the ground. They're like, get on the ground, get on the ground. And I was just like numbed. I get on the ground. They handcuff me, pull me off, pull me up, dust me off. And I remember they're holding me. And I'm just standing there. They're like, Matt Cox, are you Matt Cox? Mr. Cox. And I'm just staring at him. And I'm not saying anything. And the guy looks at, he has a clipboard with my wanted poster on it. And he holds it up and he's looking and another officer comes up and I remember he looked at me and he goes, is that him? Is it him? He goes, no, I don't think it is. Oh shit, I don't think it's him, bro. And he looks at me and he goes, no, it's him, it's him. He goes, look at his eyes, it's him. And he looks at me and he goes, hey, Mr. Cox, he goes, we've been looking for you. And and he goes, you are Mr. Cox, you are Matthew Cox, right? And I went, yeah, yeah, I'm Matt Cox. I mean, at that point, I, you know, I'm done, right? That officer told me, that agent told me when they had arrested, when they arrested Becky, Rebecca Halk, when they arrested her in Houston six months earlier, they said she didn't admit who she was until they put her hand on the scanner. They said she complained the whole 30-minute drive back to – they arrested her, by the way. They arrested her at school. They arrested her. And they brought her all the way back to the Secret Service's office. And she, the whole time she was there, being driven there, she goes, you guys fucked up. You're going to lose your job. I'm going to sue. You've embarrassed me. She said, they said, he goes, she didn't break until we put her hand on the scanner. And she goes, okay, I'm, I'm Rebecca Halk. So I broke immediately. Yeah, you got me. Yes, I know I'm done. So they bring me back. They handcuff me to a table. I wait. They fly the Secret Service agent from Atlanta in. She flies in. I'm there for hours. And uh, they come in and they read me. You know, they, Of course, they read you your rights. They tell you what you're charged with. And they say, we're going to bring you back to uh, Atlanta. And uh, they brought me back to Atlanta. And I went all the way back to Atlanta. And that was an ordeal. And what's funny is when they called... Amanda, this was weird. Like Amanda, when she found out that they had caught me, she immediately drove to the bank, went to our safety deposit box, 
first of all, there was cash in the box. So she doesn't pull out, she pulls out the cash, but she pulls out the passports. She keeps all the cash in the ice box and she keeps the cash in the, in the, um, safety deposit box. She grabs all the fake passports that I had and driver's licenses and she brings those to the Secret Service's office and she gives them to them immediately and says, I just found these. I don't know anything. I was completely duped and don't have a clue about what who this person is. I thought his name was Joseph Carter. And she gives them all my driver's licenses and IDs and everything. She later tells them that she did know who I was, but she didn't think it was a big deal. Like she, like she waits till she gets a lawyer. When she gets a lawyer, she goes in and she cooperates and she tells him who I was and what I was doing, but she had nothing to do with it. She didn't really know what was going on and it was all me and, you know, which is fine because it was pretty much all me. Um, anyway, yeah, I go back to, uh, I go back to Atlanta and I get a lawyer and I fly on Con Air, which is nothing like Con Air in the movie. And uh, it takes about a month, month and a half to get me all the way back to Atlanta because they bring you from one prison. They bring you one county jail where or U.S. Marshals hold over where they hold you for two weeks and they hold you here for a week. Then they hold you here for two weeks and they hold you here for five days. And then, so you keep getting bussed from one place to another till you're eventually flown back to Atlanta. And I was flown back to Atlanta and I was held in the uh, I was held in uh, Atlanta in two different jails. And uh, I get my attorney and I remember when I got my attorney, she told me I was looking at a, a bunch of time. She didn't really know how much time, but she said, you're looking at like 15, 20 years. She didn't really know. She said that I was responsible for like 25 or $26 million in loss. The Secret Service was saying something like $40 million, 40 or $50 million in, in uh, fraud at my mortgage company. And the numbers were all over the place. And uh, yeah, so I end up taking a, a plea. I end up pleading to 26 years and I end up getting sentenced to 26 years in prison and yeah, that uh, I get a, a PSI for 26. Uh, well, actually, my, my pre sentence report said uh, 34 years or 30, yeah, 30, 32 years. 32 years of life is what my pre sentence report said when it eventually came out. I was interviewed by the Secret Service and the FBI. Uh, I mean, I was trying to help myself. I cooperated fully, told them everything I could think of. That by this point, they'd already indicted me in in Atlanta, in Tampa, and in uh, in Nashville. Uh, yeah, so I end up pleading guilty, and I'm interviewed by the uh, Secret Service and FBI. So if you like this video, do me a favor and hit the subscribe button. Hit the bell so you get notified of other videos like this. Go back and watch the very first one all the way through to this one. Uh, leave a comment in the comment section. And uh, yeah, definitely buy my book. Shark in the housing pool. I appreciate you watching and thanks a lot and see ya.